Hello everyone. A very good afternoon to all of you who have tuned to our page Wings, Durgapur Wildlife Information and Nature Guide Society for today's session on a bit of monkey business uh, by our very well known Dr. Arjit Pal. Welcome Dr. Arjit Pal. Hi and thank you very much for such a good opportunity and I think it will be going to be a pretty interesting session for me also. So. Um, I'll okay, start. let me uh, introduce you for those who don't know you. Dr. <laughs> Arjit Pal is a postdoctoral researcher in National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. He has done his PhD from SACON in 2018 on reproductive behavior of Nicobar long tailed macaque. He has done his MSc in conservation biology from Durgapur Government College. He is currently affiliated with AIP, NIS, and University of Lethbridge. He has been granted with the Leakey Foundation grant. Else than working with primates, he has also worked with birds, elephants, amphibians, and reptiles. He is a very well known name in the field of primatology across India. He was one of the first pioneers to start conservation work for amphibians and reptiles in Durgapur region. And Wings will like to thank him for showing us this light. He will be addressing to all of your questions. Feel free to drop your questions in the comment section. And a warning a hailstorm has just passed through my area and it's raining heavily. So there might be network issues from my side. So please bear with me. And I will like to hand over to Arjitda and I will be away. Thank you, Sankar. So thank you for the introduction. Mm. Actually, when Wings asked me for such a talk, I I was really very delighted and I had no idea that what I should uh, talk about. So I finally I have decided to talk about little bit about uh, primates and especially some major primates found in India in the first phase. And second phase, I will talk about a story, a story uh, which uh, I was witnessed and in Nicobar. So, okay, let's start with uh, uh, our this session. What I called a bit of monkey business, primates, primatology, and beyond. So, the first question, what we think, what are the primates? Definitely primates are the order in uh, mammals and they have big brains. Big brains is not the size of the brain. That is the big brain body ratio comparative to the, the, their body, the amount of the size of their brain. And big brain also talked about their smartness. Uh, when we talk about any animals or uh, its uh, cognitive ability or uh, its intelligence, we always try to correlate it with their brain size. And in that way, always uh, all primates uh, belong in the top. And they're one of the general interesting characteristics is their opposable thumbs and their prehensile hands and limbs, which is uh, help them to, you know, grip something, to manipulate something, even to handle their food, prey, or whatever the other works they do. Apart from that, there's this, uh, stereoscopic colored vision, which uh, is uh, uh, very helpful to understand the 3D nature of the earth and that help them to um, locomotion and find different kind of interesting uh, 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 features of the earth in very different way than other who don't have this kind of stereoscopic vision. And high parental investment where other animals generally think about, you know, the, qual uh, the quantity of their progeny, quantity of their infant and offspring. Here, primate invests a lot more to you know, successfully rear their offspring and make them, you know, a stable and healthy life for their next, since they're living in a very complex society, they always want to put them in a, a stable condition inside their society. And another very interesting thing is their behavioral flexibility. Primates have very elastic behavioral flexibility where in different kind of environment, 
in different kind of habitat, in different condition, they can cope up and they can survive. That's why we can see, you know, bonnet, macaque, rhesus macaque and other uh, gray langur uh, throughout the India in very even agricultural land to the village area, to the urban, suburban and very strong concrete forest even there. They are successfully living. And the main characteristic what I am very much like about these primates is their innovativeness. You know, the uh, idea or the scope to solve a problem. When they face a problem, they have an idea to how to solve this problem. They always try to, you know, sometimes solve this problem very quickly than all other animals. And that is one of the criterion which make them live successfully in this human dominated landscape. So if we concise it, then who are the primates? The bonnet macaque, the gray langur, the lorises, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, even Charles Darwin. Yes, humans and all other non-humans. Primates, they all come together in the order primates. So since humans are the primates and all other bonnet races, they are the primates, uh, it will be a little interesting to see when primate emerge in this earth, how they evolve and all. Uh, I have seen that last uh, few days we were talking about reptiles and all. And one of the very fascinating uh, herpetofauna is definitely the dinosaur, the era of Jurassic World. The dinosaurs, they got extinct in around uh, 65 million years ago. And even after 5 million years after that, primate start emerging, evolved in this earth. So the interesting thing, how the primate was in the you know, first phase of primate, the primitive primate, they might not be living here, they are extinct now, but how the form of the primate was. Yeah, they were like, you know, I would like to say, quote unquote, intellectual rat. They are like mouse-like creature. Even if you people are familiar with uh, tree sieve, uh, they used to look similar kind of tree sieve. Even another interesting fact, tree sieve were considered as primate in 1980s by some kind of taxonomy since they have a big brain and they can manipulate uh, things with their uh, uh, toes uh, very handy with that. So whatever is that, now we'll take a... Uh, some short look on the primate evolution. It started around 60 to 65, between 60 to 65 million years ago. And the first primitive kind of primates which are still living are the prosimians. Uh, the prosimians, all the lemur they found in Madagascar, they are prosimians. And apart from the tarsiers and lorises, they all are the following in the part of prosimians who evolved in the you know, early Ecocene age. Then in the middle of Ecocene age, there is um, uh, another two major uh, evolution radiation. We can see that is one is the old world monkey and another is the new world monkeys and apes. So, uh, sorry, new world monkeys, old world monkeys and apes. So there is a very uh, quite difference between the new world and old world monkey. The first one thing is their distribution, all the New world monkey found in South America in countries and the old one monkeys found in the other area like uh, all the Asia, Neotropics and uh, those area. So the major difference between these monkeys are uh, the old world monkey having a uh, very dry nose with downward pointed and the new world monkey having flat nose with nostril sideways pointed. The new world monkey is having a good prehensile tail, which is absent in case of generally old world monkeys. New world monkeys, in case of new world monkey, both male and female means uh, parents, uh, father and mother, both invest uh, for the their parental investment. They both put lot of effort, almost similar effort there. But in case of old world monkey, it's generally skewed towards females. Then uh, new world, uh, old world monkeys, there are three, four major groups, which are one is macaques, 
uh, where fall, uh, 24 macaque species come under this, then colubines, all those langurs coming under this session, then hylobites were common, all the gibbons and all, then the three, all holobines are called also lesser apes, then those great apes, definitely the one of the very, you know, thrilling ones. Uh, there are gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees, and along with us, human beings. So now I'll talk a little bit about primates of India. Majorly, we divide primates in two categories. One is non-human primates, and another is the human, means us. So India, so far, 25 confirmed primate species reported from India, two lorises, 11 langur species, 10 macaque species and two gibbon species. Now we'll see a little bit about their distribution and general uh, features of these primates. Lorises, they are the prosomians. They are the, you know, coming from the primitive uh, primate evolutionary radiations. Lorises are the nocturnal and solitary animal. Especially we have seen most of other primates who lives in group, but Loris lives in, uh, they are solitary and they generally forage at night. So they have very conspicuous eyes and all. And there are their society, if I talk about a little bit more, that is in a, they have their specific territory where uh, females have their specific territory and one male's territory sometime, you know, overlapped with two or three females territory. There are three large species found in India. Uh, this one is the Bengal slow loris uh, and Malabar and Mysore slender loris. Bengal slow loris found in uh, uh, Northeast India, along with the uh, 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 southeastern countries. So there is a notion that Bengal slender loris, it is uh, uh, poisonous or venomous. I don't know what to call it. Is it really that? Mm, I don't think so. They have uh, their brachial gland. When they get disturbed, they leak uh, from that gland and uh, uh, they, that secretion come to their saliva. If they bite somebody, they get some kind of, you know, mm. infection. So since they don't uh, uh, inject directly any venom or they are not poisonous, if somebody get consumed, them uh, are not going to infect, uh, you know, uh, poison. So I don't think we should consider them as a uh, poisonous species, but that is the defense mechanism. And uh, in spite of such kind of defense me mechanism due to, you know, illegal pet trades and poaching, these animals are severely, you know, threats, uh, posing all those threats. And uh, slow loris is very smaller, it's size around 1.2 to 2 kg. And uh, now we'll talk about slender loris. Slender loris found in this, uh, find in this, we can find in Southern India. There are two subspecies. One is the Malabar slender loris, which is found in the, the moist uh, evergreen and deciduous forest, where the Mysore slender loris uh, found in relatively, you know, dry area. So if you see the right side, this two picture, it is very difficult to identify these two species even when they are nocturnal at night. Through this, the a black uh, patch, you know, surrounded their eyes. Through that, uh, primatologists try to identify them in this way. This both uh, Bengal slow loris is vulnerable and uh, the slender loris, two subspecies, both Malabar slender and Mysore slender, both are least concerned. Now I'll talk about langurs. We all are very much familiar with langurs, like the Hanuman langurs, which we also uh, call the gray langur. So there are two langur species uh, found in India. One is the Semnopithecus, another in the Trachopithecus. These langurs are group living animals. They generally live in small group or single male, multiple female. Sometimes you'll find all male band. Even though scientists reported, uh, you know, 
a group with multiple male and multiple female, but uh, they think that this group are not that stable. Generally, the stable group is, you know, one male, few females, and with that, they're infant and immature. So there are seven Semnophytheca species uh, so far recognized, distributed in India. The first one is the Semnophytheca entelas, which is also called the uh, uh, Sadhana uh, uh, langur species, or that is the Hanuman langur species. This is the least concerned species. And then there come the Seminophytheca prime. Seminophytheca prime is called tapped gray langur. This tapped gray langur found in uh, the this region, and then Seminopithecus hypolucus, which is also called the black-footed langur, and there are Seminopithecus desumeri. This is also uh, found called the southern plain langurs, and there is three langur found in the northern area. The, this one is the Seminopithecus hector, which is also called the tarai gray langur, and the Seminopithecus cristatus, which is also called the Nepal gray langur. And this is, there is a small one, right? The red one. This is the Kashmir langur or Seminopithecus ajax. Society-wise, the all langur species are, social organizations are quite same, though they have some difference in their feeding habit. Though they feed mostly on, you know, foliage and all, sometimes all fruits, available fruits and other tree blossom and birds. And now we'll, See the Trachyphyticus. There are four Trachyphyticus species found in India. And uh, this is the Trachyphyticus uh, pilatus that is uh, called the cap langur. It's also found in outside India in the Northeast region, beyond Northeast region. And Trachyphyticus fairy, fairy is limb monkey. It is also found in Bangladesh and Myanmar. Trachyphyticus gay. This is called this golden langur. This right side picture, you can see this is one of the critically endangered animal, which is also considered as one of the you know 25 uh, endangered animal of the world by the uh, IUCN primate specialist groups. And this is endemic to this area. Now people uh, scientists are saying that they are expanding towards the Bhutan region. And the last one in southern the. Trichipithecus johnny, which is also called Nilgiri langur. This is also one of the vulnerable species. So this Trichipithecus species is posing that kind of threat due to, uh, you know, pet, uh, illegal pet trade because they are very beautiful uh, looking and very glossy fur. And that's why uh, people always try to keep them as a pet. So they are posing that same. Traits, apart from definitely the habitat destruction and other things that are going on. Then we'll come to the next major group of primates found in India, after human being though, that is the macaques. Macaques are also diurnal living primates. Uh, they are group living primates. And there are different macaque species found in India having accorded different kind of IUCN status. Macaque live in a very close hierarchical society, multiple male and multiple female with immature and infants. And their society is very strong where male have their own linearity, which we also know as their social status. You may be familiar with the name, the alpha male and beta male, gamma male, like, you know, the subsequent order of their social status. And then uh, that is the female have their own uh, social hierarchy where females stay in the natal group, means where they uh, born in that same group they stay. In case of male, they migrate from other groups. So, okay, we'll see the macaque. Here we're talking about two uh, most common macaque species in India. One is the rhesus macaque or macaca mulata. Rhesus macaque is the widest distributed non-human primate. After human, the most widely distributed primate species is rhesus macaque. And the another one is macaca radiator. There is two subspecies of macaca radiator is found there. That is the dark bellied one and the light pale bellied one, macaca radiator radiator and macaca radiator dilator. 
So this two species are the most common species widely distributed in India, where Macaca mulata also distributed in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh, and uh, even uh, other southern countries. But uh, bonnet macaque is restricted only in the southern plain of India. The both macaque are least concerned, though, according to the IUCN. Here is the another four macaque we can see. First one is the Macaca munzala. Yeah, we all know that Dr. Anandarana Sinha and their group, they have discovered this macaque around 2005, I guess, if I am not wrong, uh, from the southern natural area. They are uh, uh, endemic to this region and endangered too. And the Macaca asamensis, Macaca asamensis distribution also uh, uh, widely open towards the uh, northeast India, so, uh, northeast, uh, uh, to beyond Northeast India towards the Southeast Asia. And this species also categorized as a vulnerable species. Our Macaca silenus, I think everybody of you know about this majestic lion tail macaque. Uh, they only found in the few patches of uh, Western Ghat, though there you can see this, you know, two continuous patches uh, within different by the I think Palakat Gap, but uh, they are not that continuous distribution. The distribution are quite patchy. And nowadays, and day by day, it is get decreasing. So it is a severe challenge. And from, you know, last few decades, primatologists are trying to do some conservation effort and to understand this animal and try to find out how to, you know, solve the problem. And I think now they are doing quite good. If anything you know extra pressure is not coming uh, or any extra threat are just posing them immediately and the another one primates uh, this is another macaca fascicularis ambrosia this is called nicobar long tail macaque it's found in uh, three small island of nicobar in fact this is found in the you know the most southern deep and southern territory of india this is also vulnerable uh, species. And uh, this is not actually a species. This is a subspecies of uh, long tail macaque. There are 10 subspecies of long tail macaque uh, distributed throughout the uh, um, Southeast Asia. And this is one of them. And this subspecies is endemic to these three islands. And another true primate species, Northern pigtail macaque and uh, stump tail macaque, they both are distributed in India. They are distributed in the northeast part of India. However, hmm. uh, for both of them, uh, they also found in Myanmar, Laos, uh, and this uh, uh, wide range. And even Bangladesh also, stop, you can get uh, northern pigtail macaque. But uh, it has been suspected that stump tail macaque might have been uh, uh, locally extinct for Bangladesh. So these two species also categorized as a vulnerable. So I talked about eight macaque species so far. Another two macaque species also reported from India. One is Tibetan macaque. Uh, in 2005, again, uh, a group of scientists, again, Anand Sina was one of them with them. Uh, they discovered, uh, but they found actually one, you know, uh, skin, the skin of this uh, Tibetan macaque and uh, uh, the, after that, it has been reported, but there is no confirm that kind of, you know, distribution has, so far has been listed uh, by IUCN and all. And the same thing happened in 2015 also, uh, uh, that white chick macaque that also discovered by, I think, Dilip Chetri and uh, his team they, from Arunachal again. But again, we don't have much more information about this two uh, Macaque species, so I am not going to describe them here. Now we'll go to the uh, gibbons. Gibbons also calls us the you know halibuts, lesser apes, tailless primates, and there is uh, two gibbon species reported from India. Among the one is quite uh, you know well established, their habitat and there are quite a few studies happen in the Western hulak gibbon, which is called hulak hulak and the scientific name you can see this you know male and female different kind of plumage color and the interesting thing about hula gibbon or gibbon is 
they are quite similar to us they don't have tail they live in a family male female paired bonding society with their uh, infant sometimes there will be no infant but when one to four you know immatures not infant immatures will be with them so they are totally arboreal they do the buffalo movement they feed on uh, mainly uh, totally fruit vegetable blossom bud and very small component of insect also uh, is in their diet apart from western hula gibbon uh, eastern hula gibbon also reported to the arunachal border but again uh, we don't have distribute you know quite well described distribution uh, pattern so far so i am not going to uh, describe it here so let's see what is primatology now since we know about primate the study of primate is called primatology so what is the study of primate like her study of herpetofauna is herpetology kind of thing but in primatology it is kind of wide it is a truly interdisciplinary subject in primatology you can do you know some work on taxonomy definitely identifying different class different family different species even subspecies of primates to understand their biology biology as a whole even it can be physiology or it can be their morphology the population ecology which is one of the very important thing to do for nowadays where all those primate are facing this kind of uh, threats and problems and behavioral ecology or ethology where to understand this primate behavior and how they are doing how they are living what is their movement pattern what is their feeding pattern what is their reproductive behavior so many so many things even they do deception also so so many so many things you can do about this and this behavioral study also put some input for their conservation if you don't know how a individual or how a species is behaving in its uh, natural habitat then it is difficult to right uh, 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 you know prepare some management plan in their conservation in their you know in situ conservation and all another one thing is evolution last we just saw that how uh, human evolved from the you know mouse like primate so uh, all is all scientists are interested to understand how that human evolution happened how other primate evolution happened and yeah you might think you know human can evolve from human has evolved from monkey so why so many monkeys how the radiation works and how they are living there so and so forth and another one is anthropology since it blood part of primates the old one and the apes called also anthropoid primates these anthropoid primates they have quite a similarity with genetics and their society and behavior with human being and apart from that uh, uh, especially studying humans and human related uh, you know behavior in primates to understand the you know trajectory of uh, evolution of such kind of traits that is also called the anthrop anthropology this paleontology they are also that is also some kind of tool you can say but that i won't say that is here coming as a, a whole subject though and another very important one is psychology comparative psychology where to understand other primate species to understand it in human even to understand primate species to understand how our brain works how we do uh, how we do things we do how we take decisions and so many so forth so if you say this primatology it is a wide range of study and work scientists and nowadays are doing but today we'll talk about one of the major primatology thing that is to save the primates that's why because to do this other you know academic primatological study we have to make sure that this primate species who are living in wild they are in safe they are in safe condition and for that uh, we have to ensure that we have to do the primate conservation so the, this is this one simple slide that published in i think nature in 2017 Uh, this slide is more than enough for anybody even for uh, anybody who is not specialist with wildlife 
to see why we should do primate conservation, why we should put our effort, not only scientists, all those people who care about ourselves, who like to see monkey, even who like to see all the other wildlife, why we should do the primate conservation. So far, 505 primate species has been, you know, reported. Among them, 70% are population decreasing and 45% uh, are in endangered or being going to be engine endangered. If you see in global level, what is the condition percentage wise? Around 55% are uh, threatened and 75% of the population are declining. The same thing everywhere, the same thing happened is neotropies in mainland Africa, in Madagascar, where is only concerning the Lamur, which is not found anywhere else in the world and even in Asia. So let's talk about why we should do primate conservation. What 55% of, of that uh, species, uh, all, all species are threatened and 75% population is you know, decreasing. There is no choice to intervene to stop such kind of, you know, monstrosity. So what are the major factor? What are the cause behind this kind of primate um, declination or the threats of primates? The first one is similar to all other wildlife that is the habitat loss. If you see left side, there is a graph. I am not going to any technical. This is the simple graph where the red line is talking about how the agricultural field or agricultural activity expand. So when the agricultural activity is expanding, it is altering the natural forest or habitat, natural forest are converting them to agricultural habitat. So the result, the sub decline of this natural forest and habitat all over the world and not only agriculture along that also our you know urbanization and human made other destruction all taking part so we all are part of this destruction frankly speaking so in right side you can see three maps uh, this is also from another one uh, uh, article published in science advance in 2017 the first one is uh, a mod this is a modeling though the first one is talking about in the early 21st centuries, the possible uh, you know, habitat of primates along with their richness. The darker one places are the high richness, but the greener sites are the low richness, means uh, near to one. You can see that downstairs it is species richness. And the second thing, it is a model which is showing how the agricultural activity expanding throughout the world. Here, the green one is the expansion of agricultural activity in 21st century. And if it is happened, the third map is showing what will be the ultimate, you know, species, uh, uh, primates, uh, habitable area in the end of 21st century. It's quite alarming, right? And it's really, it's a, uh, like a bad dream, bad dream, what I should say. So this is the thing, habitat loss. So habitat loss generally caused by, you know, anthropogenic habitat alteration or uh, another one thing I'll talk, uh, uh, like to talk about that is habitat fragmentation. Habitat fragmentation means uh, when uh, in a continuous path, some destructive, uh, things are happening and habitats are altering and changing in between then this natural forest patches gets you know sparks from each other uh, each other where uh, primates is a big uh, comparatively big uh, mammals they need a quite a big home range and quite a big area to you know uh, uh, migrate from one uh, population or one group to another group since it is one of their major characteristics an evolutionary fixed characteristic to uh, solve the inbreeding problem. But if this kind of thing is happening, then a primate will be, species will be forced to stay in a small area. Then sometimes the population might get crashed, sometimes due to the inbreeding depression and or the decreasing of heterozygosity 
leads to the extinction of this local small small patch animals definitely poaching and illegal trafficking the term you all know i think goose meat uh, trade so eating primate meat or eating any wildlife meat so uh, they poach primates sometimes for eating them and illegal traffic trafficking i have told new world monkeys or even prosimians and even the trachypithecus and all other monkeys also they are looking you know very similar to human being and very uh, in our you know eyes we feel they are they have very much similarity they are quite extraordinarily intelligent and smart animals so there is a craze to keep them as a pet all over the world so that illegal trafficking that is nowadays also posing another threat apart from their population are decreasing due to habitat loss there is poaching and illegal trafficking so human primate interface so a place where both human and primates stay together this photo some of you can think oh what a compassionate so woman she is she is helping the you know bonnet uh, juvenile Uh, drinking from our bottle in a hot uh, day yeah this is true but is it is it compassionate is it uh, a good thing to do no not at all human primate interface if we talk about what i believe that primates not always you know other non human primates means they are not always you know try to spend time with humans and all this is Uh, due to uh, you know this is our responsibility and what we have done in per, did in pers that uh, representing here primates are very adaptable adaptive and very elastic with their behavior and adaptability they can live lot of other places apart from their natural habitat so when they destroy their habitat they forced to live with us in our habitat and uh, and they adapted something then what we have started we started to give them food sometimes uh, later on it became a problem of you know raiding and even a, a depredation and you know destruction of our properties but uh, is it their uh, them to blame we first gave them food still we give them food in mandir in tourist spot even if we see in a market one uh, uh, langur is there i can see you that at least uh, uh, half of the fruit seller and people will offer them some food but when you were offering a primate food a non human primate this animal it to know you know that uh, about you are offering it the food uh, they know okay this is a food which we should take even when you were not offering them the food if it is present they will definitely go for it they don't have anything don't steal it don't think is in their society so you pose them first and that reflecting there and it's coming as a big conflict issues and human primate conflict is taking day by day it's very worst scenario all over the india even i think you people have heard even in himachal uh, forest department had allowed to kill the rhesus maka who they consider as one of the very um, bad paste for agriculture as well as nuisance for this uh, habitat the human dominated so called habitat but the uh, another good thing what i find uh, that uh, even though um, they have uh, asked to cull these monkeys there is not much more culling is happening there one of the reason is okay hindu goddess association with monkeys and the another one reason is also this, this people perceive that they are so you know similar to ours and they are so intelligent and so different than all the other uh, species it's very difficult to you know hurt them yeah sometime when they do uh, you know some depredation and disturb you and uh, you know destroy your properties definitely you uh, the some agonistic behavior happen but apart from that uh, i think we are we have some compassion about this primates but in this uh, human macaque interface not the direct conflict 
And another one thing also I should say, sorry, that the aggressive uh, uh, behavior approach from human to primates as well as primate to humans. Just few days back, I heard about uh, that since this is going the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, there is all shops and everything is totally closed. So monkeys living in human dominated areas or human macaque landscape where they used to get their food item mostly from, you know, the, some shops or some human habitats. Now they are not getting it. So they are getting like what I have heard only quite aggressive their uh, interaction towards human, their approach towards human. Previously it was like suppose uh, not so much aggressive. Now it's becoming little bit aggressive. That reason is where they are living, there is no natural habitat. And since they are living for quite some time, for a few decades there, they don't know even how to, you know, get the natural food. They are, you know, very much familiar with the food, what human offered and what they get from human leftover. So this is again another reason, you know, today's, you know, this lockdown phase, how these primates are suffering. That's they are suffering again because of us. If uh, we wouldn't have stopped them to feed and they would have known that how to accurate natural food, okay, some kind of you know amount of food they might collect from human habitat. If they were partially dependent on natural food too, it is easier for them to you know find food in this time also. And yeah, now come to the uh, last part of this uh, con uh, human private interface. When human primates are together, another thing which is produced risk is genosis, the transmission of disease from human to primate as well as primate to humans. So here, you know, with wild animal, human interaction happen only when human go to the uh, wild habitat. But where primates who live in with human or human who live in with primates in a human primate interface, that time the chance of interaction is very high. There are, uh, okay, you can say that there are some disease which are, you know, primate prone disease and concealed in primate. But when you distract their habitat, they come to a human habitat, chance increase of contamination increase. Or when you go to their habitat or you try to contact with them intentionally, that time also it increase. And another one thing is some, we also call uh, some heated transmitter. When uh, you got contaminated in one place, in one patch of primate habitat and you go to the other patch of primate habitat, then also you are spreading it. Because primates are not going from one patch to another patch. You are going from that one patch to another patch. And if you are carrying this kind of disease, that is also going to be transmitted through you. There are a few diseases I will talk about, like Ebola. Ebola, yeah, you, you all know Ebola virus, it's fa first discovered in the you know, Ebola River of Congo basin. So from 1994 to 2014, around 10,000 gorilla died due to Ebola. And the uh, reason of this, again, the secondary transmission due to human, tourist, and uh, even sometimes the local peoples, local uh, nomadic peoples. And the lethality of Ebola for non-human primates like gorilla is about 90%. Another is Jika virus. Jika virus also the same way. Generally, it's in you know some new world monkey. And where this is found, there most of the monkey having the antibodies within their body. But when due to hidden transmitter through human, it transfer from one place to another place where this uh, monkey don't have this uh, antivirus in their body, definitely it is going to be a massacre. And in India, one of the very common diseases, KFD, Kaisnur forest disease, which Kaisnur that is in the, I think in uh, uh, Karnataka, uh, Shimoga district, uh, they are, it, this disease transmit through, actually hosting through a tick, this tick uh, live in uh, bonnet macaque and, nil, and gray langur, I, uh, gray langur, yeah, bonnet macaque and gray langur body. So they are the ectoparasite there. So they, they are at about, I think, 12 months of life cycle of this uh, tick in their life cycle. Uh, three times when they are nymph before and before nymph and larvae and adult, three times they do some 
you know, blood meal. And that time this disease transfer from this uh, tick to non-human primates. But when human come contact to non-human primates or uh, cattle come contact to the non-human primates, uh, that time this disease again, uh, the outbreak happens and yeah, this is another one scenario. Each year around 5,000 people get, uh, you know, sick due to that. And uh, recently one outbreak also happened. Though we are now dealing with another one outbreak, uh, <laughs> it's different. And I am not going to talk about a lot about disease ecology here. So this is the scenario, what I want to say that uh, if primates are living with you in human primate dominated landscape, that at time the chance of you know transmission of these things is high. Even uh, this time, I would also like to talk about another one of our study. What we did, we collect uh, monkey poop to you know estimate their uh, uh, intestinal parasite. What I found that this monkey, bonnet monkey, sorry, a bonnet macaque living in close to human dominated area or near village, near town, near temple. The, the richness and the richness of this kind of endoparasite in their scat is higher than the other bonnet macaque who are living in forested area or less uh, interacting with human being. And in this scenario, another one thing is happening. Bonnet macaque also sometimes have some uh, uh, aggressive, the human have some you know problem with bonnet macaque. So what they do, they catch or trap those bonnet macaque, put them inside bags or cage and drop them off, you know, hundred and few hundred kilometers away from there to the forest. First of all, this monkey, they are not used to live in forest. So we don't know uh, how they will live. And again, these monkeys who are living in human habitat, they might have some parasites and some even virus we don't know or bacteria, which, uh, is not available in the uh, forested area. And another one thing is this monkey by living long time in this human habitat might have been able to, you know, develop those antibody, but in forest area, apart from other monkey, other vulnerable species are there, other threatened species are there who don't have this antibody. So when this you are putting this monkey in the forest for translocation, that may have a deleterious effect and lethal effect over other animals. So this is some kind of disease ecology. So what is the management? Well, most of the all primates, we can see that decreasing are threatened, but uh, our resources are very limited. So the best way to do it is first do a population assessment to understand that how a population is doing. What is the condition? First, you have to know that how many primates are living in this area and what is their con condition and what are the you know direct impact, anthropogenic impact or other impact there. That is the thing from population assessment, what we all do every time for other wildlife also I do. The second one is the long-term monitoring. The long-term monitoring, it is very important and very neglected one. One time population assessment and one time understanding is not enough. And then I will tell you a story. A, another study just a, a couple of years back, it's also done in Bonnet Macaque, which, where they collected data for last 25 to 30 years from different locations of Bonnet Macaque population. They found that 60% of bonnet macaques population is decreased in this urban area and around 50% in these other areas or average. So you can see which people living in this bonnet macaque area, they're seeing every day they're, uh, you know, watching this macaque and seeing this macaque, spotting this macaque. So they know, oh, these monkeys are fine. They are doing well. They, there is nothing to worry about. But where there are suppose one lakh monkeys now only 40,000 monkeys are left. And if another uh, 10 years, we don't know what is going to happen. Though these monkeys are least concerned and we can uh, you know, spot them every day, that doesn't mean that these species are not in risk. This species is at risk, but yeah, now it, still now there is a good uh, population is there. So we don't have to worry about, but we need very, very strongly. We have to monitor them from very close by to understand how it is happening. Uh, so we can take some state before it 
goes beyond our hand. Habitat protection and restoration, it is generally happening through all these uh, governmental agencies and non-governmental agencies sometimes that are doing it together. At least uh, so far, so, so few, whatever it is uh, natural forest available, we should uh, try to protect them, not you know destroy them. And I think it is a civic duty for everybody to do the same. Another is the conflict mitigation. I told you the same now um, about conflict. Uh, when you are giving food to a primate, okay, you are thinking, okay, I am giving it a food, I am giving, going it a favor. Sometimes I think it is people try to relate a primate with a dog, okay. But uh, you have to understand that evolution of dog happened in different way. They evolved with human through human society. And monkeys, they have all those wild social characteristics. What is not similar with dog? They are not, you know, uh, doing or any going to do any favor or going to make you as their friend. When you are giving them food, it is fine. But when they are, you are not giving them or they are not getting food from you, they will snatch. They will try to get it any other way. And this is happening because again. You offered them food first. So nowadays, uh, researchers are taking different kind of steps uh, for conflict uh, mitigation. Uh, suppose in some place, if you go, uh, is monkey is there? Are bhai, to dunia bhar ka monkey hai. Hello, full of world monkey, full of this place, the place to see. And if you ask some question, if there is any monkeys are coming in your uh, agriculture landscape, they will just like to say, ah, every day they come, a lot of monkeys come, they destroyed a lot and a lot of things. Is it really the scenario? Yeah, what they are telling, they're telling the truth. But they are talking about their perceived loss. There is two terms we should always keep in our mind. One is the Parsive loss, another is the actual loss. When a farmer is seeing monkeys often coming to their farmland and destroying their crops or other things that make them believe that these monkeys destroying a lot. But it might not be the case. Maybe at maximum time, this parsive loss is much more higher than the actual loss. So some researchers started doing some different kind of management problem uh, program where they give this, uh, ask these stakeholders, all these villagers or these agricultural uh, landowners to keep tab on how many monkeys are coming, which day they are coming, how much of their crop they have, you know, destroyed and what are the loss. So sometimes it has been seen that after a few days recording, it has been found that okay, monkeys, they thought monkeys coming every day, but they come one or twice in a week. And not a big group or lot of monkeys come, maybe a couple of them comes and three, four of them sometime come and they destroy a small amount of the crop. So by knowing that how much they lost, they're you know uh, destroying, sometimes people's uh, perception about this monkey sometimes get changed. So there are different, another conflict mitigation problem is, you know, uh, to do uh, keep monkeys away from uh, this agricultural landscape. I don't think that this is always is a permanent uh, solution because since they are very intelligent and more smart, first with something you can make sure that uh, they uh, are not coming in this landscape, but within, I think, few days or few months, they will understand how to you know, overcome this hurdles and again the scenario will be the same. And there are some innovative approaches happening for the primate conservation. You have heard that some organization, they have, they put some you know, canopy bridge in this you know, fragmented landscape where or some you know, underpass or overpass between the road to avoid the road kill. And day by day, different kind of uh, uh, conservation breeding program and things are happening, which also to help this primate to for a sustainable future. 
and the another one thing what uh, is very important is doing do lot and lot of study in a different aspect about this primate it's not about primate only for any wildlife you have to do different kind of study to understand their population to understand their behavior to understand their mm, mm, even psychology to understand their feeding ecology everything how many inform information you will be having about a species uh, the chance of uh, the conservation management the chance of success of you know make this uh, uh, scenario change is much more higher always it is so doing a lot uh, you know study increasing uh, this effort for scientific study is very one of the very crucial thing for this management and the another one thing not all people you know can involve academically through that but i think we have a chance to you know get involved uh, in one and another way through campaigning through doing you know what work is nicely doing by the ngo like wings and others and there is a lot of other way even you know doing that even public awareness and all so this is the first phase of this presentation now i would like to take some questions if you have uh, and yeah Hello. Hello. Yeah, Shankar. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, till now we don't have any questions. I'm not okay. sure if everyone understood everything. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Viewers, if you have any questions, just put it down in our comment section. Ah, uh, Harija. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I have a little question that I don't. I, I forget the genus name of the golden langur, but uh, in your slide I saw that some species of that genus uh, found uh, in the Nilgiri region and the rest are found in the northeast India. So uh, uh, why this happened? Do you have any idea about it? Uh, that evolutionary species and no i am not uh, quite uh, sure about this thing but uh, habitat wise if you see that uh, uh, trachypithecus that found in uh, uh, nilgiri langur uh, it is also found in the western ghat it is the uh, moist uh, evergreen forest and north east india again it is the moist evergreen forest there also you will find trachypithecus golden langur huh? the seminopithecus uh, trachypithecus gi and ferris leaf monkeys and also cap langur so i think this is something you know habitat suitability the habitat uh, uh, for them the required habitat is maybe uh, this kind of uh, tropical rainforest or moist rainforest okay thank you harida uh, arjita i have a question of mine uh, this yeah, kash yeah. kashmir gray langur they yeah. are confined to a very small place in india yeah 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 Uh, what is the population the global population of them yeah so two thing i would like to say about this the kashmir grey langur or which we call uh, seminopithecus ajax it's uh, uh, confined to a small area recently people are intensive doing this study so far i don't have the information even if it is out i don't think so people are doing research uh, even from iisc and from zoo outreach people are, uh, some uh, still some workers going on and apart from the, uh, that also some different uh, new studies about taxonomy is coming to light that these three species found in the northern india there's nepal grey langur the tarai grey langur and the kashmir grey langur and this one the kashmir grey langur they might not be you know uh, three separate species they might be the okay. same species yeah yeah these things are coming up but uh, i don't know but so far people are doing a lot of conservation effort and i am not you know quite uh, arjit i'm gonna uh, pause you for a moment there's a huge storm i'm gonna close yes, yes, the window okay okay see yes, yes, you yes. you can continue
Yeah, sir, sir. Uh, Arjita, we have a question uh, in the comment section. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a question in comment section from uh, Mohandas Giriappa. Okay. Mm. So the question is, what methodology to study groups was discussed? I missed earlier part. Actually, we haven't discussed anything about studying groups. Uh, studying groups means, uh, I don't know what you especially uh, want to emphasize on. There is two kinds of thing. If you are talking about uh, population ecology, it's different, you know, demographical data analysis, demographic demography of a group, male, female, different, uh, mature stage, sub-adult, uh, infant, uh, sex-wise, definitely. And if you are think, uh, talking about this uh, behavioral study, definitely there are some standard methodology uh, from ad libitum to focal animal sampling. And uh, where in ad libitum, where we take only the note about what is happening there in a free flowing way and focal animal sampling where, when I fixed our eye on a uh, individual and we go on with you know what this individual is doing uh, for 15 minutes 20 minutes uh, one hour what will be your focal time limit and another is scan sampling scan sampling is talking about you know scan or a photographic memory generally it's happening in uh, you know after a certain time of interval to understand the group behavior this we don't actually collect uh, uh, behavioral data here, uh, we collect behavioral states like, you know, resting, feeding, uh, social behavior like that. And apart from that, uh, all occurrence sam sampling, if you are thinking of or collecting a very, very specific behavior. So for that very behavior, how it is happening and what is the interval, what is the frequency, what is the, of this behavior for that, uh, you can go with all occurrence something. There are other methodology also for experimental and other. And these are the general, you know, principle, uh, uh, you can say, methodology. Uh. So we have another question. How to study population in the area? Yeah. Um, for population study, you have to, you know, if it is Makaka uh, Langur, I just told, they are group living animal. So for group living animal, if it is a, uh, the first thing you should do is to understand the group demography. Group demography means in a group, how many male, how many female, how many immatures of different sex are there. You can do a transect, straight line transect or line transect, whatever will be feasible in that landscape, I don't know. And while you will be going to the transect, you can do it temporal, you can do it spatially, uh, uh, according to the design you think will be suitable and will be uh, uh, good with your feasibility. And while you'll be uh, doing the transit, uh, you see if you found any group, then you have to uh, count the individual number, then you can get the uh, density. And if you unable to get the, you know, all the individuals, age, sex, and the number of the group individual, huh, then uh, you can go with only the group, how many groups are there, encounter rate of groups. So uh, it can be, you know, very uh, concise about all information about their demography, either wise only the number of the individual of the group, or only the group where it's located, where you can get that result. Okay, I have another question of mine. Uh, you showed that there are different uh, Langur populations. Are there any overlapping uh, in the Langur populations? Uh, very interesting question. Actually, yeah, overlapping is there. Overlapping is there. Uh, but it's not quite, uh, means uh, overlapping means you are talking about totally overlap. Uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in a single place, uh, different Langur species are being found. The regions are overlapping, distributions no, overlapping. Okay, okay. No, same genus, different species uh, generally don't, uh, you can see, in the marginal area of two, uh, uh, you know, habitat. Uh, in the marginal area of two species distribution, you can find both species. Sometimes you can find even a mixed group of two different species. It's uh, even okay. for the, uh, I, for that way, I would like to tell another one story. 
So I have uh, show you a slide about bonnet macaque and uh, rhesus macaque, right? Rhesus macaque totally the northern India and bonnet macaque in the southern India. So nowadays, what is happening? Rhesus macaque is dominant over bonnet macaque. So the distribution of rhesus macaque coming towards no, 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 southern sides and expanding, while the distribution of bonnet macaque is squeezing. So this thing happened, competition happens and they determine their distribution that way. And for macaques, okay. rhesus are very dominant. So it uh, uh, is happening quite, uh, I think quite first. Okay, we have a comment from uh, Partho Marcus Mishra. Great talk, Kashmir Grey Langur. One person is working from IISC, but it has been on halt due to political reasons. Also, hopefully the species ID won't change for Ajax because Langu taxonomy is still under work, then population needs to be done again and distribution too. Hopefully more young people will be interested to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Partha. Partha is my colleague. We are working together for last uh, eight years. Yes. And yes. Yeah, we both we together have been to Nicobar and still we are working together. And Partha, thank you very much for this information. Yeah, this is the thing what I told that. People are working there from everywhere because this is a small pocket. This uh, langur is there, and this is again due to political reason. You cannot access the idea easily, and but I think within a couple of years, if all this uh, difficult time pass by, we'll get some news about what is going to happen. Okay, we have a very long question from Paramit Chatterjee. How can we integrate psychology to conservation management of primates? as it will vary individually as well as in groups and in each population at each locality. Primates are highly adaptable as well as tolerant to habitat changes. So to determine a suitable habitat of a primate species living in a highly fragmented area, what should be the important factors that should be considered according to you? Hmm. That's uh, definitely very good question. Uh, you could, uh, could you uh, put this question in yeah. screen? Sure, sure, sure. sure. This first question, Paramit, uh, what I would like to say that uh, this is another thing. When we talk about human primate interaction, even uh, the aggressivity of these primates uh, always we keep in our account. Uh, it will be, it should be different for racist macaque who are more aggressive than the bonnet macaque when we consider that. And definitely for in situ conservation, if you see in, uh, sorry, exit conservation in zoos or in other enclosure, uh, when we think of, the, you know, uh, for conservation breeding program or zoo keeping these primates. So that's primates, uh, how their society is, in their society, how it is work. So suppose you keep two or three individual there of uh, who are the group living primates, huh? then you won't get the success of, you know, uh, they won't live even for a long time, even even get a conservation success. And there are other interactions, how, what should be the ratio of the alpha male, sorry, male is to female, adult male to adult female. And when, uh, what is the space might be required in an enclosure? And what are the enrichment might should be there? Because this, all of the factors come out from their natural behavior. How much time they spend for grooming? How many individuals in the natural group? How they interact openly with each other? And how they eat food, they eat together or they eat separately. That way you have to design. That's also. Even uh, there is one success story about this kind of conservation breeding of primates. And the information come from India through my very own beloved sir, Professor Meva Singh. They have studied this macaque in wild, the lion tail macaque. And then they successfully make, uh, after psychological and ecological studies, they successfully prepare some management you know, plans for the zoo in the Europe and America, where successfully this species are breeding, though not in India. So quite, we are quite successful though. That's one story. Okay. And the second question, Baramit, uh, what uh, about this habitat one? What you have asked that primates are highly adaptable and okay. So, what should be important factors to consider according to me? First of all, what I think the important factor primates, I have told you, they are generalistic species, right? Uh, and they are very flexible. Though they are living in a uh, 
specific uh, habitat type but they don't require that much you know micro habitat uh, they can broadly live in a bigger habitat so by keeping that in understand and their feeding ecology and that uh, if they are frugivorous or if they are insectivorous uh, if we consider this and again the threat uh, sometime uh, the ratio to prey predator if this primate have any predator considering that and the effect of you know disturbance from human some primates always try to be in a very you know they are very shy they are not so docile they want to stay away from human so these are the thing you should consider not you know like you know lot of modeling and i think you might be thinking of that kind of environmental factor because a minute change of scale of this kind of factor doesn't really impact macaque what i think doesn't really so yeah you have to call, think of uh, their habitat and the integrity of habitat the connectedness and how the you know movement is happening uh, between different populations since they are you know phylopatric groups are there always different sex are moving from each other group so i think you should consider these things rather than uh, other thing okay so uh would you like to continue with the presentation arjit da yeah see you see you see you okay people if you have any question you can please uh, write your question in our comment sections and arjit da will be glad to answer you and your all queries okay uh, now just to finish to talk about indian primates and the major species now i'll talk a story another primate who faces tsunami and uses tools mm. uh, it is another primate but the most obvious primate if people know right we human being we face tsunami yeah in uh, tsunami means i am talking about 2004 december 26 tsunami that's badly uh, from sumatra it came and badly hit the our southern coast as well as andaman nicobar archipelago this is a photograph uh, this is uh, after 8 years of tsunami this is a moist evergreen pristine rainforest post tsunami impact you can see how devastating it was long long kilometer after kilometer it's like you know same kind of barren dead tree and if you see there after salinity this mangrove plants they are emerging out it's really beautiful how nature works really sometime i get wonder okay some animals who used to live in there might be affected but again nature finds it uh, way to again live regenerate it's amazing so yeah this another primate that another primate that lives in three small island of nicobar uh, i think now you can all get to know this primate is nicobar longtail macaque it's also called nicobar crab eating macaque though i have never seen them to eat a crab that's different story so nicobar longtail macaque is one of the 10 subspecies of longtail macaque longtail macaque is widely distributed in southeast asia uh, one subspecies distributed in india it is endemic to india's this three island only so i was lucky to witness some of the story of about this macaque me and just uh, you know a couple of minutes back one of my colleague partho he uh, gave me some very valuable information he was with me and another my friend abadud he was also with me we three we started working on this macaque long back not long back sorry in 2011 so before I go what uh, we used to know what was the information what we was known about this macaque up to 2000 there was no information at all so i used to put them as a data deficit yeah we definitely know that this macaque is living there in this island nicobar islands but uh, there is no news in 2004 uh, there is a study done by umapathy and uh, uh, his associates they uh, first this is the this was the first study on nicobar longtail macaque is a rapid population survey but they found that this, this macaque is distributed in these three islands and after doing the coastal survey and all they extrapolate there will be around 4800 individuals of this subspecies 
that time they put uh, ayushan put their cell them as a near threatened and after all those information considering their threats and all they put them in vulnerable in 2008 uh, so what happened in 2004 26th when the tsunami hit it massively hit in andaman nicobar archipelago okay after around 15000 people died in that area even in from nicobar one island around 1800 people died whatever uh, that is very sad and apart from people there is a habitat loss there is a property loss there is other animal loss so when we are talking about the most southern three island of nicobar since it was coming from the south part it hit badly all those three um, this nicobar makak habitable island it lost about 90 percent of the coastal habitat of this island completely lost it totally and inland habitat also and uh, it lost mean this island this coastal area got inundated because now it is submerged in water the three percent of the islands population is now uh, sorry land mass is submerged under the water and this nicobar macaque or all this long tail macaque they used to live nearby the face water or water so sometimes they call river and refuse it so this coastal habitats were one of the primary habitat for them so 90 percent of coastal habitat loss has a severe impact on them and that directly affect those uh, macaque population definitely a lot of macaque died and the population sharply declined a study in 2010 uh, uh, conducted just after tsunami it suggests that population sharply declined and the demography alteration demography means the number of male female of different age sex class in a group so why demography is important uh, generally for each and every species they have a certain uh, ratio for demographic the ratio means the ratio of adult the male is to adult female there is the female is to immature uh, that is the uh, male is to female like that so uh, this uh, a uh, specific ratio uh, that is optimum ratio that increase the productivity of the group means the reproductive output of the group so always each group try to maintain their uh, this uh, demographical ratio similar or very close to the optimal ratio through which they can be you know very stable and uh, reproductively output will be should be you know higher so those are the information was there both were the small study then yeah in 2012 uh, we started for nicobar uh, we went to andaman from andaman we by ship we went to nicobar and yeah definitely those are the very beautiful islands and uh, yeah you have seen the photograph of other uh, you know south uh, east asian island i think that nicobar is one of, like one of them only one of the beautiful one and it is a beautiful one for go for leisure and this thing but uh, when you are going for a you know particular are uh, doing something particular study in your mind to do a intensive survey to collect intensive data on a species to find some answer like what was the major question was our mind is how this macaque are doing after the population crash how you are doing so there are a lot of logistic problems mainly that time there uh, uh, and the island syndrome it is not a, a psychological island syndrome or physiological idol syndrome of rat uh, where animal get you know bigger and very energetic it is the opposite of that when you were living in a small area a researcher sometime you know staying a place for a long time and you know when you are not getting to do a lot of work due to the climatic condition and post tsunami scenario those islands were not so much you know accessible those part where we want to go actually we went to visit all over these three islands to survey properly intensively but that there was a lot of problem but yeah finally we overcome all this uh, and we are thankful to the local people, forest department, especially the few local mainland settlers and our Nicobaris friends who help us. Nicobaris tribes are living in the Great Nicobar Island. 
so who helps us a lot to you know conduct the study without their help even though we whatever expertise we had whatever logistic uh, you know support we had it was totally impossible for us so it is very interesting always you know the look working with local community and even to tell them why we are coming to mingle with them to be there with them and doing your research the success increase i don't know how much uh, uh, our mission was successful but whatever we thought that uh, what are the questions were our mind the first one was how these monkeys are doing you know 10 years after the tsunami after the self decline we got a good answer and the answer was yeah a ray of hope i would suggest what i found the population is recovering where the uh, here there is a, for each graph you can see three column i'll quickly say this first one is 2004 study the second middle one is the uh, post tsunami study and the right side one is our study where what we have found that we have found that mean group size increase and also uh, male number which ultimately due to increasing male number the demographic ratio was abnormal that also decreased demographic ratio was good that time positive and here also female, uh, immature percentage increase that means the reproductive output is getting higher and immaturity adult female percentage also high how many adult female number of adult female also that uh, uh, positive towards how many infant you are going to get for next season right so that way it was a very hopeful population was recovering and demography was very stable reproductive output got increase and what was the more another interesting thing is Uh, previously before tsunami when all the coastal habitat was intact that time this maka gets to live totally in forested area after that uh, some of these monkeys come close to the human habitat and try to you know uh, raid crops and accustom with uh, hu- uh, some small orchards were there so uh, eat those kind of foods and all so these monkeys apart from that also we found their life history traits in some specific behavior about their bath seasonality and other behavior there is a alteration in this behavior alteration means compared to the other subspecies and we believe that those things because they are living in such a stressful environment so they have adapted they have changed their behavior according to this habitat and try to make themselves you know comfortable in this habitat or to successfully live in this habitat and uh, Yeah, so far what you can say that these monkeys, they are doing quite well, recovering until until another natural calamities or you know the human induced or anthropogenic other problems or other disease problems. I don't know is not posing them. They are doing well. So after answering the questions, we dig into more into their life to witness how they are living, how their society works and all. Nicobar long-term macaque live in a hierarchical society. Hierarchical society, I have explained to you that it is a rank-based society where male have different rank, alpha, beta, gamma, and females also same. With female phylopatry, where females live in the same group. In all macaques, actually, it is female phylopatry group. What I have told that female will be living in their natal group where they born, and male will come from outer group, and also younger descendancy in female hierarchy where suppose a mother have uh, three infant uh, uh, a b and c c is the younger one and a is the older one so c younger one infant of this mother uh, female infant daughter of the mother will get the next to mother social rank and after that the middle one and the elder one so that way it works and in a society there is competition they don't have money to bargaining so they compete for food and sex and male generally compete for sex and both male and female they compete for food and but competition not only uh, stand between small aggression it leads to some fight because when the alpha male has the most who is the leader you can say who is the most powerful male in this group can monopolize all this female can mate with all those females chance to sire more offspring 
so for all adult males that is the aim to you know be the alpha male okay due to their physical ability and other politics they all are not might be succeed but always they try to do you know uh, uh, topple the existing alpha male and become alpha male which is called the takeover event so that is also common in this macaque and when the takeover event one we have witnessed and there one male from outer group came to our study group he had a very bad fight and our a lot of uh, individual got injured especially the old alpha who got toppled and new individual uh, become the alpha and the old individual died also and also we understand that this competition not only uh, be is inside this maca group you know this is also beyond a group within the population there are different group of this macaque living in this area uh, this uh, uh, competition also happen between this group this between group competition again between group competition for the same reason the food and the mate so between group competition when we study between group competition we saw that both male female of one group fight with another group they fight there is a vocalization sometimes they don't fight sometimes i have seen one group after just realizing other another group go away from that places so we thought why why not always they are fighting because this is important from them why they are not fighting so after doing some research what we found that they do is basic math yeah they do a basic math what they do they count the individual from their group are going to fight with the individual of the opponent group if the individual of the opponent group is very much higher than them it's definitely it is obvious that they are not going to win this fight so generally they avoid this fight so that is the they do some numerical you know thing there uh this macaque i also consider this one of the smart macaques of uh, so far what i have seen and yeah indeed they are this macaque other macaque what they do they uh, find some food which are fruits or insect or things and they eat it uh, this macaque they find some food which is not even visible and they eat it here you can see the photographs where these macaques are eating the coconut they don't only the eating the tender coconut in the left side photograph they also removing the husk from a you know very dried matured coconut and they break the shell and eat the coconut it is a difficult task for us okay it is it seems very easy but in primates who are living with uh, in you know those habitat where coconuts are available this is the first uh primates who so spontaneously it's coconuts by uh, plucking it then processing it completely for the all different stages this maca also used tool yes and not only used tool they manufactured the tool yeah they don't have any shop from where they can ask okay give me a hammer or give me a you know uh, pliers i'll do i'll open a coconut or i'll do this i'll do that what they do they find the suitable object which can be used as a tool or if they don't find a object even they make a tool here i have we have seen some behavior like called uh, when uh, some fruit item is you know covered with mud or some dirt they try to clean it with their hand sometimes they use some leaf or some wrapper like plastic paper if it is available and if nothing is available they cut a twig of a tree with their teeth and they take it and roll it over uh, this fruits here you can see one sub adult male is cutting a uh, sap uh, twig and trying to use it over a coconut they also do it over some you know uh, smooth surface fruit as uh, to get a uh, good grief over it so that way this monkeys are very smart in this they find this kind of different uh, solution to 
uh, explore different kind of foods. And yeah, definitely coconuts are very much available there. And if they are not eating the coconut, what is the use of it? So what they have started? They have started to how to break a coconut, how to crack a coconut. And not only by their dexterity or manipulative behavior with their cognitive skill, even by using tools and even if tools is not available, manufacture it and then use it. And this is the uh, thing what always amazes me. And not only eating, after eating, they also do dental hygiene. Yeah, they floss their teeth. After eating, they eat on coconut or pandanus. Then uh, they floss their teeth through with uh, sometimes some feather, uh, sometimes some metal wire. Here you can see an adult female is using a metal wire to floss her tree. Sometimes some uh, thread from nets, sometimes some grass blades, like uh, both synthetic and natural thing. So yeah, might be they, they might do this kind of thing to clean their teeth because the teeth are the most specious you know, element or features of their body, right? Even for eating and even for fighting, yeah. So there I'll, this is the thing about this makar. Now I would finish my talk. Uh, before going there, I'll show you a small video. And our finding about this macaque, such kind of innovative tool use and other smart behavior has been documented by Mongave India and they and that video I'll show you. It's a, I think one minute's video, then we'll close and go for the discussion. Uh, let's see that video. Thank you. Yeah, now we can open for the discussion interaction session. Lovely presentation, Arjit Da. Thank you so much for your yeah, value. Thank you too for this opportunity. Yeah, and currently I am working on primate cognition as well as primate view view. So any of you want to know more about these primates, uh, Indian primates? And uh, especially, especially now I am working with bonnet macaque, lion tail macaque, and racist macaque. So if you have any interesting questions or interesting thing about you, even you want to get some experience on primate research, how it's done. So I now currently I'm based in Bangalore, though maximum time I stay in field. But uh, after this COVID situation got settled, you may contact me, we can think of something, we can talk something and i would love to help you people yeah okay carry on Devan has a question let us assume a male of nltm which comes from the outer group to fight the alpha male of a group and the male from the outer group wins the fight and gets access to the alpha male's territory and females just curious to know does it kills the infants of the earlier males as seen in other mammals another question how do they communicate yeah, uh, very, very, very interesting questions, uh, the band. First of all, yeah, exactly the same thing happens. Uh, uh, that one male, I have told you, na, from outer group came and it toppled the uh, group individual and then uh, alpha male and become the position. But it is not like, you know, so subtle. It is not so sudden. It is like, you know, the king is dead and long live the king. 
okay the smell the old alpha will be there new alpha will be there and the thing process should be happening we are talking about macaque we are talking about a very intelligent group of animals who have a very close relationship with each and each other each and every individual and all females are related to each other since they are living their maternal group all are you know cousin sister cousins and all and mother sisters are like that relationship close not so there if one alpha male is get toppled who is by the way from a, already from outer group and another outer group male come they take some time to adjust with that what uh, what do we experience that what did uh, that uh, uh, new alpha male did it started aggressive showing aggressive after winning the fight it started showing aggressive behavior to all other males and females especially females try to forcefully mating sexual question with this females and there are a lot of interesting thing that time happened no we have not uh, seen any direct infanticide though but one infant got missing just a uh, few days after the take over event but what i think that uh, uh, infanticide event is because when in a group a new male come it try to mate with this female quickly if a female is having a infant which is suckling that means the female is with galactic amenorrhea that time the female cannot get pregnant so if the infant got killed by or the male kill the infant that time the galactic amenorrhea will break and the estrus cycle will start and in the concept period if the male mate with the female the female can get conceived so the, the idea is breaking the galactic amenorrhea but here nicobol long tail macaques are not seasonal they are non seasonal means throughout the year they uh, can breed so they uh, so they are uh, uh, this kind of event uh, not reported so much uh, uh, for other subspecies also and these subspecies also i am not quite sure because what i have seen that females quickly try to you know uh, solicit the male and uh, when female get receptive their uh, tail region and anogenital organ get swollen up in rhesus macaque it get reddening got sexual reddening here it get swelling sexual swelling and little bit yeah. reddish also so that is a signal of getting that i am receptive the female is signaling to the male so i have seen that within two week all female develop the swelling and male start to mating with this female and female also allowed the new male to mate with them but the interesting thing not is here there is uh, the gestation gestation period for this macaque is around 6 month but after this swelling phase and this mating phase even next Eight nine months, I haven't seen any female to give a birth. What does that mean? Means though that time the swelling was there, though that at time there was mating, but no conception. Means the females through tactical deception deceived the male. The swelling was not true nature of their receptiveness, and okay. uh, yeah. So those are the reason. Those are the counter strategy females took to avoid the. infant decide or infant killing event by the new male so i think that is the reason it is not so often in maka but yeah one infant is a probable infant study event we have seen that might be not the direct intention might be a collateral damage when a female uh, opposed to mate with a male and the communication you talking about there are plenty of communication apart from vocalization though vocalizations and different ranges they have gestural communication they have uh, other limb and other communication definitely it is there uh, they have very good gestural communication and it's very fine tuned okay. thank you divan so uh, divan has another question what's the population of uh, nicobar long tailed macaque in nicobar now Mm, nicobar long tail macaque only found in nicobar three nicobar island great nicobar little nicobar and kachal only here you will get so the population is now recovering we haven't done entire population survey but uh, what we have done we, if we ex extrapolate i think around 6000 individuals are there if we extrapolate okay. 
but it's it's, it's not exact figure because we haven't done it and it is not the way to how science work do it long term study when you were doing you are seeing that how this macaque previously recorded how they are now and if they are you know frequently sighting and all all this aspect you take together you, you, you try to you know speculate what and design what is the thing is there so here but i'll say that uh, they are in uh, now in good way no like that okay uh, a question from my side uh, are the hmm. macaques threatened by wildlife trade the macaques or langurs hmm. why not they uh, the macaques uh, wildlife trade poaching is there okay if you see the i have told you na that uh, uh, tibetan macaque the tibetan hmm. macaque in india the repo, report was uh, they they found in arunachal ex skin of tibetan macaque uh, the ncr people uh, i think anand sinha was there with them also so they okay. found a skin of macaque and then they related to the tibetan macaque skin so this is there this uh, kind of thing is in in yeah in our region if you see the, uh, if you talk about your west bengal or the central india and the southern india okay people the need macaque because most of these are you know there is hindu tradition having a uh, link with you know hanumana and all Uh, and here these macaques are not posing the threat but in other area the primates definitely and macaques you have seen na mm. other primates i remember i think early 2010s at early 2006 or something uh, there is some monkey i think they were old world monkey tamarins got stolen from alipur zoo this okay. you know people even here wh where this is not monkeys are not distributed people are going to you know steal them for i think pay it only this monkey people don't do any other thing and lorises we talked about lorises yeah. in india southern india and even i think some part of lorises you know, lorises are considered an bad omen and they use in lot of you know this kind of black magic and all stuff and very horrible okay. people treat them lorises are, but very less information we have about them Okay. Are there any records of Bengal loris from uh, West Bengal, like uh, any historical recordings? I don't know of any of this. I don't think of. I don't know though. But somebody okay. released that should be there. But I don't think it is the natural habitat here. There is no habitat. But northern India, uh, northern Bengal, which is near to Tripura, I don't know the forest linkage. But uh, I am not quite sure. Uh, but okay. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the lovely yeah, presentation. Thank you so much information about primates. Uh, what the basic idea is? Uh, primates means bandar. Bandar ek hi hota hai. Many people think that chota bandar, bada bandar. But there are so vast distribution of primates, especially monkeys, if we can say. There are different species, and people will get to know a lot about them through your presentation today. Uh, thank you, thank you to be with you people. And it is yeah. Uh, but the thing is, monkey is yeah, bandar, bara bandar, chota bandar. Uh, and I think we people know about that. That is enough if they know what how to treat the bara bandar, chota bandar even. Because if in <laughs> your area there is no uh, forest and there is no that uh, you know charismatic or so called rare species, uh, mm -hmm. so it's fine. In my area, if there is species. But how to treat the races? In my area, there is a red langur. How to uh, treat the grey langur? How uh, we should think of them? How uh, we should uh, you know, interact with them? We shouldn't interact with them actually. And that is the thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Arjit Da. Uh, a question from Partha Marcus Mishra. Can you tell hmm. a bit about yourself? Uh, wings. Many of us would like to know. I would uh, request Shagar Da to. Tell about wings. How are the? Can you turn on your can camera? You yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wings is a uh, NGO. Okay. So our full name is Durga Pur Wildlife Information and Nature Guide Society. So as our name implies, so wildlife information. So we try to provide the information about the wildlife. Okay. and uh, nature guide so we also try to uh, guiding people towards the nature towards the sustainability etc so uh, it is a very brief description about our society so what is our activities activities like uh, providing wildlife information like we are creating uh, 
uh, website to provide water uh, around us, like what is in the West Bengal. And nature guide like uh, green picnic mission, like don't destruct the habitat of wildlife. Okay. Uh, uh, we also visit some schools to award the people. Okay. And you can see this is a lockdown talk. It is also one kind, one kind of nature guiding activities. Uh, our other works are identifications of different animals with our limited knowledge. We have different Facebook groups like the amphibians of West Bengal, reptiles of West Bengal. Uh, we also have the group of uh, living uh, wings, biodiversity of Pushing Bodhaman district, etc. Uh, our other works are uh, environmental impact assessment and uh, help the government uh, to understand about uh, or to aware them about our local diversity, so etc. etc. This is our activity. Thank you, Sagarda. I guess. Uh... Partho sir, we have answered your question. So, Shagarda, should we end today's talk? Yeah, see you, see you. Okay. Arjitda, thank you for being with yeah. us. It has been a lovely time hearing you talk. And uh, so, take care. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. Stay safe, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.